we should stop worshiping. We should keep worshiping. Let's stand together. Spirit of the serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing. I was nothing until you found me. You have given life to me. Heartache. Heartache. Broken people. tonight we quiet our hearts before you this afternoon <laughs> I'm not going to teach that long um, Lord we we just want to be still before you and like Elijah Lord listen for that still small voice you have spoken to us in your word and we believe Lord that you'll speak to us again so we wait on you and we listen to you in Jesus name we pray amen go ahead and be seated we're in second Thessalonians Chapter 3. You know, I've been called a Jedi a couple times, and... <laughs> I was thinking it's too bad that I'm, you know, the old Skywalker instead of the young one. You know, the old one's got a beard and wears baggy clothes. He's fat, <laughs> lives all by himself on an island somewhere. <laughs> if I keep going pretty soon, I'll be Yoda, just wrinkled up. And I've appreciated so much all the teaching so far. And uh, especially, you know, it, you know, the last session as Steve was talking about praying, for your pastors. That's one of the two things that I liked so much about his teaching that he, he encouraged us to pray for our pastors. But, and that, so that helps me. I like that. But then the second thing is that he's keeping alive the use of the word rad. That was such a rad teaching. That was rad. How many of you are old enough to remember that phrase? And then remember when it shifted to bad? Oh, that's so bad. Remember it was like back and forth. Back in the old days, remember those fashions? Do you remember uh, members only jackets? Do you remember those? O the only the members could have them, which was anybody could, who could afford it. And we had all kinds of trends and fashions, and and uh, but we grow and we get older, and hopefully we're growing in the Lord and growing in God's grace. But you know, I'm thinking about fashions and the way the world wants to fashion us. And the scripture tells us there in. Romans chapter 12, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. And the world, word for, for conformed is schemata, the scheme, the plan. There's a fashion the world wants to shape us in. And one of those things is what we're talking about here in 2 Thessalonians. You know, in verse 6 to verse about 14 or 15, he admonishes us, 
with a very healthy meditation. He says in verse 6, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we charge, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked. Paul the Apostle says, we didn't eat anyone's bread free of charge or without paying. But we worked with labor and toil, night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we don't have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly or unruly manner, not working at all. And what happens when you don't work, you usually have enough time to talk about other people. And it says they're not working at all, but they're busy bodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, don't grow weary in doing good. But if anyone doesn't obey our word in this epistle, note that person and don't keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. So shame him into obedience. Yet, it says in verse 15, don't count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Lord, we pray as we come to the, the end of this second epistle to the Thessalonians that you'd help us to understand what was on the heart of the Apostle Paul and really your Holy Spirit. These are two books that we've taught and we've studied with relish. We delight in the doctrine of the, the rapture, and we are excited about that. And yet, Lord, strangely, there's this serious and heavy admonition at the very end. Because it seems like people were not engaging in their own work or the work of the ministry. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as I came to this passage, I... I question why, you know, at, at the end of his letter, usually Paul would just give greetings to, you know, other people in the church and say hi to so-and-so and make sure that those two ladies get along, that kind of thing. But here he has an admonition about hard work, and, and it puzzles me a little bit. I, I wonder why, why would that be the case? Um, but it's not a new thing. In fact, it's kind of been peppered throughout his first and second epistles. You know, in his first letter to them, in chapter 1, verse 10, he says, We rejoice that you turned from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son, Jesus, you know, to come from heaven. So the theme is set right away, that this is what we're doing, that we're waiting for the Lord to come back. But within that, there's a question of, well, how do we wait? Do we wait like we're waiting at a bus stop? Do we just sit and do nothing? Or is there a way to wait? Is there a proper way to occupy until he comes? In chapter 2 of that first epistle, he said, You remember how our labor and toil night and day, we labored so that we might not be a burden to you. And we read something very similar to that here in our passage. But he's already said that in his previous letter. We, we worked when we were with you because we didn't want to burden you. The heart of a true minister doesn't want to be a burden to others. But then in chapter 4 of that first epistle, he gets very practical and he says, listen, as we're waiting, this is the will of God. First of all, your sanctification. Don't get into lust. Be pure. And then he says, secondly, don't take advantage and defraud your brother. Be honest. Be pure and be holy in your treatment of one another. But then he says in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 4, increase more and more. 
excel more, gain more advantage, do more, but aspire to lead a quiet life, mind your own business. And that doesn't just mean keep to yourself. It says, pay attention to what you're doing. Mind your own business. And usually people that are minding their own business, they're not bothering with other people's business and becoming busybodies. But he says, mind your business, work with your hands like we commanded you, that you may walk properly and lack nothing. So this has been a theme to the Thessalonians. Um, in chapter 5 of that first epistle, he says in verse 12, Hey, recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. See your spiritual leadership. See those who are not just working in the Lord, but they're working and they're laboring and they admonish you. He said, esteem them highly in love for their work. And we exhort you again, he says, we warn those who are unruly um, to be careful. So this, this warning has been throughout the whole path. It's not just something he came up with at the end. But there's something about it, you know, I don't know if you've ever worked with somebody who, have you ever had a person that you worked with that was kind of a slacker? They always seem to be gone when the, you know, the boss said, we got a big project, and they call in sick that day, or, you know, when the, the poor shows up, they're in the bathroom for a break. They always seem to be somewhere else where the work isn't. And don't you just love to work with those guys? No, you don't. You want them, you want them gone. They're, they're just nothing but a burden to you. They drive you crazy. They're untrustworthy. Well, the same thing could be true on the battlefield. If you have a soldier that's not faithful to the guys around him, he's, he's not just lazy. He's a liability. If he doesn't clean his weapon, if he doesn't take care of his space, if he's unruly or if he's disorderly, then he's just a hassle for everybody else. And so Paul knows this. And in my version, I have this word disorderly three different times. Your version might say unruly or not obedient or something like that. But he uses it again and again in verse 6. And then he speaks about it in verse 7. And then he repeats it again in verse 11. And so this is really the theme here. It's how to walk, not disorderly, but orderly. Not without rules, but with the rules of the Holy Spirit. Um, the opposite of disorderly is obviously orderly. It's arranged. It's disposed to a pattern. It's methodical or marked by order. A soldier might have the title an orderly. And what does he do? Well, he performs services, he carries message, uh, he does things for his superior officer. Same kind of thing in a hospital. There might be an orderly. That's a title for somebody that just takes care of business. They do routine and heavy work. They clean, they get supplies. Both of these are very important jobs. But could you imagine an orderly in a hospital that was disorderly? He would be a disorderly orderly. He wouldn't get anything done. He'd just be busy doing nothing, and he would become a busybody. That's a great danger for us. We live in a weird culture where we're exhausted, but we're wired. We're exhausted, but we're wired. We have so much artificial stimulants, whether it's through our phones or the internet or how much coffee we drink or monster energy drinks, and we are wired, but we're wiped out. And we're no good for the kingdom of God. Because we might be active, but we can still fall in this category of being disorderly. Because we're busy, but we're not busy doing the right things. We're busy spinning our wheels. Or we might be lazy. We might be disengaging. You know, that's what this word means. It means to be um, disinterested in effort. Disengaged. And as a man, I can tell you that sometimes being disengaged is the greatest, most wonderful thing in the world. Can I just disengage? Can I just get away from all the things that are happening in our culture more than ever? But the opposite is this, to be marked by order. It's the role of somebody that helps sick people in a hospital or a soldier that serves a superior officer. The Greek word for disorderly or unruly is a taktos, without tactics. In fact, you'll notice in verse 6 it says, we command you. Now, this is, this is an injunction. This is, this is a command. It's not, hey, and by the way, at the end, if you can remember... And what he does is he uses the full title, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that in verse 6, but now again notice it in verse 12. It's almost like bookmarks. He encapsulates this command because it's so important. And, and the word ataktos, or without order, or disorderly, unruly, means without direction. And it's used in a military sense when somebody is out of rank, or they're marching out of order. 
You know, everybody's marching in one way, but they're doing their own thing. They're wandering around, you know, just looking at the clouds. And, and so he uses a military command. I command you. And he says it twice. And he uses the title of the Lord almost as, you know, the commander of the Lord's armies, who he is, to say, make sure that you deal with guys or girls that are not in order. Mark them and make them susceptible to shame. <laughs> Something we don't do in our society. Everybody's so afraid to offend other people. But, but there's this effort because the opposite of disorderly is orderly. And, and really, it's that it's used in the Bible over and over. When Jesus appointed a mountain, the word appointed. Or when that man came to Jesus, the, uh, the centurion, he says, I too am a man set under authority. That's the opposite of this word, tacto, ataktos. It's the word to be set. And so he recognized this order that God has given. Again, in Acts 15, this word is used, they determined. It's a person who is determined, unruly, would be not determined, indifferent. In Romans 13, it says that the powers that be are ordained by God. By God, the great executor, he put them into place. So to be the opposite of that is to be disengaged. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we read about those who have addicted themselves to the ministry. And that's the word, to be engaged. They love it. And so we're to be on the lookout for those that aren't engaged with, say, their family or their job. They're just lazy. This was a word that was used for not just soldiers who were out of rank, just uh, deviating from prescribed orders, but it was a word used for people who didn't show up to work. They lived a life without direction. They didn't approach life in a sense of saying, I have a tactic. I know what I'm made for. I know what I've done. I know what I can't. I don't know everything about God's direction for my life, but I know that there is a direction and I want to find that direction and I want to execute that direction. But there are people who have, they're completely indifferent. They don't think about God's plan for their life. They don't think about any strategy for living. They, they have no plan of attack. They have no tactic for approaching life. The Bible warns us about sloth. It's one of the seven deadly sins. Well, the mother of sloth is disorder. It's disorder. It's being disengaged. It's not caring. It's being active but doing the wrong thing. Busy, but busy doing nothing of value. What a danger today. If you spend an inordinate amount of time on the computer doing nothing, you need to stop. You need to have order in your own life, and you need to be wise enough to put it down. Stop playing games. Stop binging on things that have no value for you. Get off of those web pages. They're created in such a way to create an addiction to scroll and scroll and scroll. If you're addicted to the news, be careful. Turn it off. It's killing you. Because what it is, is it's allowing you to disengage and just float with the current. And God doesn't want you to do that. He doesn't want you to be just like those rats that followed the Pied Piper out of the city, just dancing along with the music, not listening, not paying attention. No, every Christian man must pay attention. Walk circumspectly. Look where you're going. Pay attention. Have a purpose in your life. And if you don't have one, pray. God will give you one. Years ago, that campus ministry used to approach uh, those young students, and they would give them their opening line. God loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. And as simple as that may be, I find it to be very profound because it is true. Most people have no idea what their life is supposed to be, but we know that it's a fact that God has a plan for each man. My job is to find out what His plan is for me and to help you to find out what His plan is for you. That's what our purpose is. But some people, they live a tactos, without any tactic, without any sense of it, without any question of eternity or the value or their purpose for the kingdom of God. They're oblivious to it, and it shows in their work ethic. It shows because they, they have no purpose, no intention. In some ways, this first exhortation to us, with, which is an exhortation to withdraw. In verse 6, it says, when, when you find a person like this, withdraw from them. In other words, don't make a lot of effort to hang out with them. You're not going to learn anything good, but separate yourself from them. Push off. Just keep them at 
an arm's distance. Be careful. He adds the same thing in verse 14. If anyone doesn't do this, mark them. He says, note that person. Don't keep company with them. Now, sometimes, though, I find that this is almost a self-fulfilling commandment. People that aren't engaged in their physical work and their work in the world, usually they're not very engaged in the life of the church either. They're not always interested in fellowship. They're interested in other things. They're interested in the pleasant distractions that keep their mind off the serious subjects of life. But this command to us to separate from these, it it also tells us that God is not interested and He doesn't need lazy people for His kingdom. I mean, when God called you, you might have been lazy. I mean, I'm not... I don't know if I'm the worst person, but I, I can find myself to be very lazy. I love being lazy. And I'm good at it. But I also know that I can be addicted to busyness. Just to get up and just start spinning the wheels and working on things and and building up whatever it is that is in front of me. Oftentimes, though, men or women, they they don't really engage in church uh, because they're not very interested in spiritual things. All too often, though, the, the opposite is true, that they're so engaged in their work that they have no time or energy for spiritual things. So this doesn't just tell us to, hey, be careful about those, but it tells us that God is interested in people who are industrious and people who have a plan of attack for their life. They have a strategy. And it's not their own. It's God's plan for them. God wants to bring you into his program. You know, we read about the devil and his tactics for us. He has a plan. In Ephesians chapter 6, it tells us that we should put on the whole armor of God so that you can be able to stand against the schemes or the wiles of the devil. I always read that and I thought of wiles. What's a wile? That's like Wiley Coyote. Remember Wiley Coyote? He's always hatching a plan, you know, to catch this roadrunner. And he never, he never gets it done, but always somehow an anvil seems to fall on his head somewhere along the way. But, but the idea is that the devil has plans. And he even asked, remember when he asked about Peter, and Jesus said to Peter, listen, the devil's been asking about you. He wants to sift you like weed. He wants to rattle your cage. He wants to shake you down. But I prayed for you. And when you're restored, so Jesus knew Peter was going to go through it. Listen, the devil has a plan for your life. You darn well better know what God's plan for your life is. Because if you don't know what God's plan for your life is, when you get tempted, when you get rattled, when you get sifted like wheat, there may be no recovery. But see, Jesus told Peter that there was a plan. He says, when you are restored, then strengthen your brethren. You're going to make it through. Why? Because I have a plan for you. We love that verse in Jeremiah, don't we? I I love it. You love it. God says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for good, to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. And I love that because God says, I know the plans, but I don't always know them. I know my only plan is to stay in the will of God wherever it is, and he will lead me in his way. But I'm glad that God says, I know the plan that I have for you. And he knows your plan. You just have to stick close to him. The devil has a plan. The world has a a scheme to fit us into its mold. Well, how do you avoid falling into the pitfall of being a tactos or without a tactic or becoming like this? Well, Paul tells them in verse 6 that they received from him a tradition. You see that there? Tradition. A custom. Uh, He said that earlier in chapter 2. He mentioned the traditions in verse 15, to hold fast the traditions. Sometimes we downplay traditions because in the New Testament, uh, the traditions of the Pharisees were so stifling, right? Uh, They said to Jesus there in in, uh, Mark chapter 7, he said, why don't your disciples you know, follow the traditions of the elders. And Jesus just snapped back. He says, Isaiah was so right about you guys. You, you draw close to the Lord with your lips, but your hearts are, are far uh, from him. And, uh, and, and so traditions are sometimes seen in a negative light, but the truth is that good traditions are right. Dead traditions are religious, they're formal, they're empty, they're worthless. But Paul the Apostle said, hey, we lived in such a way that you 
should base your behavior on our habits, our practices. So do what we did. Now, some traditions, we can all agree, they probably should go away. Um, and like I was talking about, members-only jacket. What other traditions? I mean, mullets were a fashion that they're, we're glad they're gone. Now, some guys are still sporting them, and we got to pray for those guys. Or how about lines in the side of the head? Remember when we'd shave lines? Some of you guys don't even have that option anymore. Um, or the double, they do the mullet with the lines. You know, just different things. We, we had fashions that came and they went and they didn't change our lives. They had no value. And religious traditions can be just like that. Now, most of you probably didn't come from a heavily religiously traditional background. In Calvary Chapel, we don't have tons of traditions, although we're gaining them more as we go along. But some traditions we can lose, but good traditions we need to hold on to. We need to press on to. I heard about this old Buddhist guy in China who hundreds of years ago, he, he was meditating and he wanted to make an offering. So he put some butter on his windowsill, but then his cat came to get it. So he took the cat and he tied it up to the bedpost with a little leash. And, and, and then he just did this. But he was a very revered old Buddhist man. And, and he just would tie his cat up to the bedpost and, you know, put butter. And a hundred years later, he has followers. And they always put butter out on the windowsill and they tie a cat to their bedpost and they have absolutely no reason. They have no idea why they do it. They just do it because they do it. That's a tradition. That's a thing that doesn't have value. It doesn't have meaning. But, but we have healthy and good traditions like coming to these conferences or meeting together for prayer or being in church or meditation with the brothers. Missions, worship, Bible study. See, healthy and good traditions are keeping the living faith of those who are now dead. But bad traditions or traditionalism is dead faith in people that are still living. We don't need dead traditions. What we need is a godly, living, active, healthy faith and habits that boost and exercise and engage us in worship and in service. The first sort of admonition is there to separate. The second one would be Observe us and follow. Pay attention. And then, of course, he repeats his command and he encourages them not to treat this guy as an outsider or like an enemy, but remember he is a brother after all. And the purpose of our, our, uh, our encouragement or our admonition or exhortation is to restore. And at the end of the letter here, he, he signs off with his own salutation, his own writing in his hand. And I think we face a unique situation in our world today. Christianity is the same in the sense that we have the same doctrines that the apostles did, and we have the same word of God, and that's wonderful. But the times have changed. We live in a day and age where we're so connected like never before, but we're so absolutely and utterly disconnected. You can have a thousand friends online and be the loneliest person in the world. We live in a strange time. And you can be part of a huge, thriving church, but not really growing in the Lord, not really engaged. Years ago, after World War II, the, the best way to travel became um, air. Airplanes were just being developed. And, but before that, everybody got around on ships. You know, if you wanted to go somewhere, it took you know, months to get there. It was hard. You'd, you might not make it. You'd get sick on the way. But, but now the airplane had come. And people were traveling quickly and... World War II was done, so all the ships that had been outfitted for war, either to take supplies to one destination or to treat uh, medical patients or victims in a, in a different destination, or to go to battle, to go, you know, all of the ships that existed in the world were basically ready for war, but they didn't know what to do with them. And a group of entrepreneurs got together and said, well, we've got to think of a different way. We've got all these ships. And so they, they thought in their mind the good thing to do is just make a cruise. It didn't exist before that. Let's just put a bunch of people on a boat, feed them till they pop, make them play shuffleboard, and we won't even go anywhere. We'll just go around in circles and come back to the same port. And it was good times in America back then, you know. The economy was going well, and it took off. It did well. And the birth of the cruise era began. And all of these ships, they were retrofitted. They were changed to accommodate not passenger travel, but tourist travel. Passengers go somewhere, tourists don't. And they would just go and they'd park in these nice, posh areas with, you know, blue waters and clear sky, and, and the, the people came. 
And the ships weren't used for medical missions anymore or for, for delivering supplies or for fighting a battle. It was just used for floating, floating around. Just take people out on the ocean, fatten them up. As long as you gave the passengers everything that they wanted, entertainment, food, they were happy. They didn't care if they were, weren't going anywhere. See, they, <laughs> they didn't have a destination. They were the destination. And they were happy, and it was a success, and over time, the ships got bigger, and so did the passengers. They just feed them the whole time. <laughs> and well-fed and lazy, these passengers and ships mirrored something else that was happening in the United States shortly after that. You know, many missionary uh, ministries and entrepreneurial pastors, they realized that people weren't so much interested in medical missions or relief missions or spiritual warfare or bringing the gospel to the sick, they weren't interested in getting people to heaven. They realized that people would be more happy if they just floated around being entertained and comforted. They figured people weren't interested in the destination as much as they were interested in the comfort, the comfort of the journey. Where they were going in church didn't matter as much as making sure the passengers were comfortable. So over time, congregants and parishioners, they, they weren't given any marching orders. They weren't told that they were needed, that they had to be on duty, that they were a soldier in God's army. And this wasn't a playground. This was a battleground. This is the church of Jesus Christ. No, you see, the ship had changed. It was no longer a battleship. Now it was a cruise ship. And it got bigger and bigger. And boy, when you went into one of them, you'd get every last need and desire that you wanted taken care of. Some of these places, without a purpose or a destination, they focused on comfort and cuisine and, well, the churches grew. Cruise churches, mega churches, giga churches, with everything except a spiritual tactic for people's lives. And they're training people that their whole purpose was to come to church. That is not our purpose. Our purpose is to get out of church and go reach a lost world. What are we doing sitting around? There's work to be done. But you see, the mindset of people have changed. Now, I have to say, big churches aren't bad. Big churches are wonderful. And many churches are huge because God is working there. But a mentality was sown into the minds of millions of people that your purpose as a Christian was to be a consumer to sit around, hardly participate, follow the circus, go on a cruise. But it's a lie. God's purpose for you is not to attend church. It's to be a mighty warrior in His army, not to be unruly and disorderly, but to march in time with His Spirit, to go and to do and to engage. If work is your ministry, then work well and make millions and give it to the Lord. If ministry is your mission, then do it with all your might. Engage, don't disengage. Oh, we, we know this is difficult in our culture. We're so busy. We're just, we're, I mean, we're stuck in traffic half the time. We've got, we've got, We've got too many shows that are too good. We, you know, people get upset now that there's, there's not enough time to TiVo all their, all their shows. And so they you know, take a vacation and they just watch TV the whole time. <laughs> and they're just being drained and depleted of their spiritual purpose and their energy. God wants to raise up an army of men who will march with purpose. Are you walking in your Christian life with purpose. I hope you're not strolling through. I hope you're marching. And this passage teaches us, yeah, to watch out for those who are unruly and to lead by example. A true minister doesn't want to be a burden to anyone. He doesn't want any free things or handouts. But as we step away, we understand God is interested in people that will serve the purpose of the rapture, and that is to get people ready to take the gospel. God's looking for men who are fully devoted to Him and ready to engage the world around them. 
Men who are ready to fall in. Men who are ready to stand in rank. Instead of a picture of um, Uncle Sam pointing at you saying, I want you, the Holy Spirit would say, I want you. And he's not asking, by the way. We command you, brethren. Oh, this is an order. This is an order to fall in. He's looking for you. He's looking for men whose lives are in order. Men whose lives are ruly or under the rule of the Holy Spirit. I think of that scripture there in Second Kings chapter 6. Remember when Elisha was there with his, uh, his assistant in Dothan. And, and the king of Syria was upset because Elisha knew all their battle plans. And so he sent an army. And overnight the army of the Syrians surrounded the city. And when they got up in the morning, Elijah and his, his, uh, his servant there, they looked out and the servant of the Lord, um, the servant of Elisha, said, oh no, what are we going to do? We're in trouble. And Elisha, you remember what he said, right? He said, don't worry, there's more with us than are with them. And then he prayed, Lord, open the eyes of this young man. And as he prayed that, the, the eyes of the young man, they were opened and he could see what he couldn't see before. He was looking at the same thing, but he was seeing something completely different. For in his eyes now he could see that the fields and the hills were surrounded. They, they, the, the army of the Syrians down here were surrounded by the armies of the Lord, chariots of fire and horses and angelic warriors. It was awesome. What a sight. He could see the spiritual realm. He could see a spiritual army surrounding the enemy filling the mountains. I pray that the Lord would open our eyes to see the army all around us. Look around. This is the army. These men are the army. Go ahead. You can look. Look around. What you're looking at is not what you saw before. God wants to open your eyes and when you look in the mirror, I don't want you to see a peon and a peasant and somebody mark. You're the soldier of the Lord. You engage. You step up. The church isn't led by superstar pastors that seem to do it. No, the church moves forward as an army marching on its knees. Oh God, man, if I could encourage you when you look in the mirror, pray that the Lord opens your eyes so that you can see what God's purpose is for you. It's not to float. It's not to cruise. I live in Waimanalo, one of the most wonderful parts of Hawaii. Um, a paradise ghetto, we like to call it. We have just, it's so beautiful. The scenery is beautiful, but there's weird people all over the place. Sometimes I go down to the beach, and one morning, it was real early, I couldn't sleep, and I went out to the beach, and, and there's just creepy dudes all over, just in the bushes, like, spocking out, putting their pants back on, you know, throwing away stuff, running away from cops. It's weird. So I'm on the beach, and I'm okay, because I'm not worried about too much physically. I'm not going to get taken advantage. <laughs> but there's this guy just cruising down the beach, just hustling. <laughs> and I thought, oh, good, this guy, and he's coming right at me. I thought, okay, what's going on? So I, I said, hey, how's it? What's up? What you doing? He goes, just cruising. <laughs> and he walked by. And I'll never forget that because he was not cruising. <laughs> he was on fire. He was just marching. But he was marching in the wrong direction. And that's what happens when, we, when we're just cruising. We end up marching in the wrong direction. I'll close with this. You remember there was an old great, great pastor, Robert Murray McShane. He wrote a fellow pastor, a friend of his, Dan Edwards to encourage him. And in his letter to him, to encourage him in his new post, he said this, don't forget the culture of the inner man, of the heart. How diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean and sharp. Every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. And you remember that you are God's sword, his chosen vessel unto him to bear his name. 
in great measure, according to the purity and the perfection of the instrument, will be the success. In other words, you are God's sword, his saber. And as a cavalry man will keep his saber clean, God will keep you clean. He'll keep you sharp. But you have to be part of that. And your success will be according to the purity and the perfection of yourself as an instrument. It's not great talent, McShane said, that God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. If you want to be used by the Lord, just become more like the Lord. A holy minister, McShane continues, is an awful weapon in the hand of God. Guys, I want to encourage you to be sharp. Be clean. Be transparent. And as the scripture tells us, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Keep one another sharp. Keep yourself holy. Stay engaged. And if I can encourage you to engage even more, in your work for the Lord. At your job, do it as a, as a job unto the Lord and let him use it. And may the Lord open heaven and pour out his Holy Spirit on you and bless you and anoint the tactic that he gives you. Amen. Can we stand together? If any man come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me into life eternally. Deny himself, take up his cross and follow Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. There's like three people that know that song. Can I teach you a song? It goes like this. Repeat after me. If any man... Come after me. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me into life eternally. Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. You ready? If any man come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me into life eternally. Deny himself, take up his cross and follow Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. That's kind of a marchy thing. You can even swing your arms. It'll help. Try it. If any man come after me, bum, 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 let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me into life eternally. Deny himself, take up his cross and follow Follow Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. I'm not done. We're marching. Let's march. Like in the old days in Sunday school, Father Abraham, right arm, left arm. Maybe the Lord, the Lord put it on my heart. I know some of you guys, hands in your pockets still. Come on, we're talking about engaging. Pull them out, marching. Hop, hip, hip, hip. If any man come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me into life eternally. Deny himself, take up his cross and follow Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. If any man... Now everybody in a circle, Joe, just kidding. The sing. Let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me into life eternally deny himself take up his cross and follow Jesus he is the way the truth the life and so you'll never forget it if any man come after me ba -ba -ba -boom, let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me into life eternally deny himself take up his cross and follow Jesus he is the way the truth the life everybody sound the alarm
God bless you guys.